Uh, before we get into our speaker, let me uh, give you a couple of announcements that uh, uh, are important. Uh, some of these are at your table. Everybody has at your table probably this uh, brochure on deep dive. There's a new deep dive class or uh, uh, program starting, so if you're interested, um, look at that brochure. This has been a hugely successful um, effort. I think this might be the fourth iteration of the deep dive, so it's really taken off. Um, also at your tables, you'll see there the announcements on the various focal points that are coming up. Um, so I won't go over all those except uh, any focal point that is until where can I find the money must be interesting. So I, that uh, probably will get a lot of attention. Uh, the first Friday forums that are coming up, uh, this uh, in June we're going to have the uh, three CEOs of the local secondary um, um, educational facilities, uh, Lakeland College, LTC, and UW Sheboygan, who are going to hear, come here to talk about what each of their facilities are doing to prepare our workforce uh, for tomorrow and today. So I think you're going to see there's a lot of interesting things happening, probably things that you didn't even realize were happening and changing. So that's a, a good program. In July, we take the month off. We come back in, in August, and we've in, invited Senator Johnson to come here and speak. Um, and, 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 and they've tentatively approved that, although with any uh, uh, public official, especially at that federal level, uh, something can happen and their schedule gets changed and they have to cancel. So there's always that caveat. But that's our goal for uh, August. And then in September, we've uh, confirmed Reed Hall, who's the new secretary and CEO of the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. Uh, that should be very interesting. And by that time, you'll have had three or four months in office and can tell us how he's dealing with all the challenges facing their office. Um, you also have a brochure on the safety conference that's coming up. And again, I would encourage you to look at that brochure. Um, it's a good program, a good conference. Uh, also at your tables, um, there's a uh, little postcard on, on uh, making their mark. This is uh, there's no postcard there. Okay. Well, then this was a timely announcement. Uh, <laughs> uh, important announcement. Uh, all of you, I think, are probably aware of Coastal Connections. Um, it's the Young Professionals Organization, and they've instituted this program every year where they, they, they acknowledge 10 um, young professionals who are making a difference in the community. And this is their annual uh, awards banquet, and that takes place on Tuesday, May 14th, from 5.30 to 7.30. So if you're interested, um, you can go to the Chamber website and you can sign up at the Chamber website uh, for this program. Um, so that'll be a good program. And then finally, before I kind of get close to announcing our speaker for today, um, there's also the Leadership Institute that the Chamber has been running every year for many, 25 many, years. 25 years. Um, and they're looking for candidates where at the time where they we take candidates. So um, in your businesses, if you have someone you'd like to uh, have participate in this program, it's a great program. Everybody who's gone through it uh, really enjoys it. So we encourage you to look at that and, and, uh, and, and either yourself or someone in your business participate. A couple of other announcements I'd like to make. Um, I think all of you know that our committee has been working, the advocacy committee has been working on the fact that Sheboygan County is a non-attainment zone. Uh, for uh, the only county that's non-attainment in, in the whole state of Wisconsin. Um, half of Kenosha County is non-attainment. Um, really unfair, grossly unfair, defies common sense. But to change it is difficult. And we're starting to work on that. And we had a meeting about a month ago or so with a whole host of uh, federal officials and DNR and EPA uh, and we decided one of the things we're going to try to do early on is see whether we can file an application. Uh, we be, it has to be determined, it might be the county who does that. File an application with the EPA to at least have a portion of Sheboygan County taken out of this non attainment. Um, and we, we had to have the DNR prepare some detailed information. They have now completed that, and we're looking to. Um, look at the final application and get that approved and hopefully within 30 days we'll be able to submit that 
and at least see whether we can get half of the county or a portion of the county accepted out from this ridiculous non-attainment stat that's been given to us. So we're, we haven't given up on getting the whole county out. That's going to take a little larger effort, and there's other um, efforts going underway to, to do that. So that just brings you up to speed a little bit on what we're doing there. And then the last thing, um, our committee, um, if any of you are just enjoying the advocacy committee that you have, to me that organizes our first Friday forum that's working on this non-payment, we encourage you to, to join our committee. In the last couple of months, we've had two new members join us, um, Dan Plopper and uh, Kelly Bell. So we welcome them, them and, and would encourage anybody else to join our committee and help us kind of conduct some of these efforts. I think with that, I'm ready to introduce our speaker. Um, our speaker today is uh, someone who we've uh, we've had uh, sort of on a, almost an annual basis. Always gives us a good update and good program. And, and Todd uh, Berry is with the Wisconsin Taxpayers Alliance. And the purpose or the mission of the Wisconsin Taxpayers Alliance is to help the public, uh, helps the public and press understand how Wisconsin government work, governments work tax and spend so informed citizens can promote responsible policy making. And Todd himself has been, um, he has been president of Wisconsin Taxpayers Alliance since 1994. His experience spans the public, private, and nonprofit sectors. And in the late 1970s and early 1980s, he was assistant secretary of the Wisconsin Department of Revenue and he was executive director of the governor's tax return uh, reform commission from 1983 to 19. This is really small. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, right, yeah. Yeah, it's small and dark, so I feel like doing okay. Uh, he was a marketing executive with one of the Wisconsin, one of Wisconsin's oldest family firms, and Todd served as a member of the. Nonpartisan Dane County Board, the Jefferson School Board, and CESA Number Two uh, Board of Control, and he's also served 14 years on the North Central College Board of Trustees. I think with that, I'll introduce Todd to give his sort of annual update to us on how Wisconsin governments work and uh, how we should feel about this government. <laughs> Good to be back, and uh, it's good to, I'm getting to even know names here, so I've come back enough. Um, yeah, this thing going. Um, you, try to, you try to put at least some amount of humor into it, like it's sort of dry, boring stuff about you know, what's going on with the economy, and uh, state government in particular. Um, Obviously, this talk is about Wisconsin. Um, the reason I have Dorothy and Toto up here is the, sort of the metaphor I'm using is to suggest that Wisconsin really is sort of at a crossroads. Um, we don't know whether we're Kansas or Wisconsin or, as I posit here, whether we're going to be more Oz, Wisconsin, or Wisconsin. And, um, that's okay. Okay. Good. Um, and uh, I sort of look at the last 10 years as it's been more Oz like than anything at times I've felt that. So um, that's sort of the theme here. You know, where are we now? We, got, we do seem to be at some kind of crossroads, and what kind of decisions might we make going forward? What kind of choices do we have? Um, and just to briefly outline what I'm going to talk about, oh, we have to, there's the theme. Are we going to be more like Wisconsin and be grounded in reality, or more like Oscansin and return to fantasy? Um, I want to talk just very briefly about sort of some backdrops to state government, about a little bit about Washington and, and a fair amount about the economy. A really quick run through some ancient history that I've shared with you in the past, talk about the current state budget, 
and some sticking points. Um, when you have one party in control, and it doesn't matter whether it's Democrats or Republicans, what you find is suddenly the happy family has issues <laughs> among <laughs> itself. And you, you will see that start to emerge, uh, uh, and it already has, and then sort of close with some questions. Um, at your table, there's a, a copy of our monthly magazine, one with sort of the blue box up in the corner, and that one is on school enrollment kinds of options and choices in Wisconsin, which is an issue in this budget. Um, it, this doesn't take a stand, it just sort of reviews how we got there. And then inside there are two of our bi-weekly newsletters that cover some of the material I'm going to talk about here. And then there's also in there just a brochure that's about us. Um, and there are a number of Sheboygan area individuals and firms and foundations that support our work. But if you don't and want to, the brochure tells you how to do that too. So to get started, um, Wisconsin has a fair amount of money flowing to it from Washington, even though we tend to rank low compared to other states. It's a fair amount of money, and this is going to be one of the things the legislature is going to be struggling with in this new state budget, is what do we do with all the federal Medicaid money with the advent of the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare? And uh, the reason people are somewhat uncertain is this picture, and that is the, the federal debt has been around 35, 40, 50% of the output of the country up until fairly recently, and now it's up in the 70% range, and the forecasts within the last year were that by 2030, 2040, it was going to get up there. I mean, we were going to be pushing 200% of the national output, and if that happens, and I'm not going to read this whole thing to you, but the Congressional Budget Office did a really interesting report two or three years ago when it basically said, if things get this bad, nobody's going to buy U.S. bonds. And when nobody buys U.S. bonds from a government that is borrowing to run itself, you got problems. And you get, you know, the, the bond market collapsing and interest rates rising and inflation accelerating. And if you thought the 2007-9 recession looked bad, that would be far worse. So this is the backdrop and why people are a little bit nervous in state government about what's going on in Washington. Um, a little bit about the state economy. This summarizes more or less the past decade in terms of our growth, our output per person, GDP, ver compared to other states. And a uh, lot of numbers, but the yellow shows Wisconsin. And what it says is we ranked 22nd in the country at the beginning of the decade and 29th at the end. And what that circle says is we grew, our growth rate was 35th in the country. So the last decade uh, was sort of a modestly slow one for us. If you're wondering what one secret to success is, just jump down a couple lines there to the corner ta of the table with the box where there's a one. That's North Dakota, uh, fastest growing state in the country over the past decade, and you can spell it O-I-L. Um, another way to look at the Wisconsin economy is just jobs. Um, there are a lot of partisans in Madison that flap their guns, gums over this, and frankly, they all get it wrong, um, but I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, one thing that, that I think we need to understand as, as the partisans go at each other over what's happening with employment in Wisconsin is to realize that the story goes back a long ways. It goes back into the mid to late 80s. And the red line is Wisconsin, the blue is the US. And what this shows is that up into the 90s, well into the 90s, Wisconsin was outperforming the US in terms of monthly employment growth every single month for 87 consecutive months. Into the 90s and through the 90s, we were, were more or less matching them. We were outpacing them about 35% of the time. But the last decade, uh, you know, you can see that red line isn't doing quite as well. So, it, you know, this, this slowing of job growth in Wisconsin is not a new event. 
And in fact, if you look at all those lines going up and down the peaks, you can see the peaks are getting smaller. And that means both nationally and in Wisconsin, monthly employment growth isn't bouncing the way it did, say, 20, 30 years ago. Um, I did mention the partisan wrangling that goes on. Um, the, to be honest, there are multiple ways to look at employment, and depending on where you're sitting, on which side of the partisan aisle, you'll pick and choose the numbers you want to use to make the point you want to make, and both sides do it. Uh, and I would argue they're both sort of wrong, and also that they, neither of them really totally get employment and employment creation. And I think this quote, and I may have shared it with you in the past from the Kauffman Foundation, is really pretty telling. They study entrepreneurial activity, and what they're saying that is in the last 30 years, net in this country, all or virtually all jobs have been created by relatively new uh, firms, startups. And so rather than all the political rhetoric we hear from both sides of the aisle, what we need is a pretty sane, mature discussion about firm creation. Um, because we don't do that very well. And I'm going to share some numbers with you and try to tell you a little bit of what's behind these job numbers. One thing is just population. Wisconsin is an older state. It's not growing as fast as the rest of the country. You can see over the past decade, um, you know, our population growth uh, was something like two-thirds of what the country is, and you can see it, that red part is flattening. Uh, and we don't need to look very far around our own communities to get that, because two-thirds of the school districts in Wisconsin are losing enrollment in any one year. And the reason that's so significant is if you have a fairly stagnant student population, eventually you're going to have a fairly stagnant labor pool. And that is what's coming in Wisconsin, is, is a fairly stagnant labor pool in terms of size. That's important because what the baby boomers did, of course, was there were a lot of them. They got married, they had kids, they bought houses, they bought cars, they bought refrigerators, they bought, bought, bought. And there was a lot of income and sales tax revenue generated from that. So it's a little bit different um, economy coming than, than in the past. Here are the firm creation rates. Wisconsin, over the last 20 years, we w were ranked in the bottom 10 states uh, on the left. The good news is on the right, and I think this reflects in part um, some of the heritage and ethnicity of the state. Uh, certainly the German-Dutch kind of character of this part of the state. And that is, we may be a little conservative with our money in terms of putting it at risk to start new firms, but when we do, we work our tails off. And what these figures also show is that Wisconsin does a better job of keeping young firms alive than the rest of the country. So that's sort of the economic backdrop to all this. Obviously, if um, the economy isn't as growing quite as fast, the tax revenues aren't going to grow quite as fast. Um, during, the, during the 90s, and those of you that have heard me speak know that this story, during the 90s, the Wisconsin economy was really performing at a pretty good clip. We were cranking out tax revenues, and uh, frankly, we got a little bit ahead of ourselves. We committed ourselves both in terms of tax law changes and spending changes, uh, that created problems when the recession came in 2001. And so we spent the next, after a year of sort of boom and partying, then we spent the next 10 years in state government playing all sorts of games and tricks to try to balance the budget or make it look that way. So two years ago at this time, uh, we were inheriting, oh, let's call it a $3 billion surplus. Um, Part of that was just due to having to fill a bunch of temporary holes from the prior budget, and part of it was due to the fact that the federal government had been backfilling Medicaid programs across the country with federal stimulus money. When that money went away, um, Wisconsin had to put money into Medicaid 
Uh, and they ended up putting over a billion dollars of new money into Medicaid in this budget. So that, that last budget was a really pretty painful one. Uh, the way I like to describe <laughs> the last 10 years and the hole digging there's the metaphor is really what we did to balance the budget, at least on paper, is we had a hole, so we dug a new hole and took the dirt from the new hole and put it in the old hole and said we balanced the budget. And then we had a new hole, so the next budget came along, we dug a hole, we took the dirt from that hole and we put it in the hole we already had and we kept doing that. Um, things are a little different now. Um, going into the state budget that will pass in the next month or two, for the next two years, um, we don't have that carryover of IOUs or past sins. That's good. The forecasts are that the state may run a surplus of something close to a half billion dollars uh, by summer. Um, whenever you say surplus in Madison, it doesn't matter which side of the aisle. They all, they all lose it. Um, they all have ideas for it. And of course, I've spent the last 10 years saying, would you guys just sort of sit down and fold your hands and shut up for a while and have a little bit of money around so you don't lurch from crisis to crisis? But I think as you'll see, we probably are going to lurch from crisis to crisis. Um, so the question now with the state budget is, we've done all this pretty hard lifting the last two years. The, the, fiscal situation is a little bit better, are we going to build on that or are we going to forget the last 10 years and go right back there? Now, so to look at the new budget, the tax revenues aren't exactly setting the world on fire. What these blue bars show is the state tax revenue growth year by year over a long period of time and all you need to see is that the blue bars on the left are higher than the blue bars on the right. <laughs> and, you know, three or four percent Revenue growth for the state in this period of time is less than half of what we were seeing in the 90s. So it's not like we're setting the world on fire. Um, in terms of spending, the line is the amount the state will spend from its general fund every year. And the two points at this side show what the governor's proposed. So by mid-2015, about 15 plus billion a year. Um, if you look at the, at the bars on the bottom there, that just so shows how much the spending was growing uh, on average. And you can see all that vibration in the middle, but on either side, the conclusion's pretty much the same. Given how fast the economy was growing, state, the state would increase its spending about three, three plus percent a year. And sure enough, that's what's proposed in this budget. The one thing that's different about this budget, though, and there's the amount of spending that's going up, $730 million. The thing that's different about it is how narrow the new money is being spread around. And so here are the main things that are getting new money, and you'll see that the, most of those bars are pretty small. Um, shared revenue over there on the right is state money that goes to localities and counties uh, and municipalities and that's really not going up and hasn't gone up for a long time. Um, the, the bars that are going up are the health service bar, and the, which is Medicaid, and the public instruction bar, which is various kinds of money for K-12 education. When you put those two together, you get over $700 million, which is what spending is going up in this budget. In other words, all the new money is going to two places. Medicaid, just as it ate the last budget, is coming close to eating this one. Now, um, when you put the money and the spending together, you, of course you know whether you're running a surplus or a deficit. By law, we have to at least on paper say we have a surplus. And that's a history of those going back over the last decade. And the bottom line is, uh, well on the left side, those numbers are all pretty small in terms of millions of dollars. Um, what those two circled numbers say is that in terms of what we spend per year, we had reserves of only about a half of 1%. That is really low. How low? Lower than any state in the country going into the last recession except Arkansas. 
one of the things that raises questions about whether we're moving forward with sort of a frugal Wisconsin approach to budgeting or whether we're going to return to the land of Oz is those bars on the right are getting smaller. In other words, the state would be drawing down its surplus again over the next two years to the point where relative to what it spends, we'd be about in 2015 where we were in 2008, which should give us some pause. This is the state, and through this whole period, we've been running deficits on our financial statements, and I have a better picture of that later. Let's just talk about a few of the things that legislators um, will be debating in the, in the coming few weeks, and sometimes they'll agree with the executive branch, and sometimes they won't. Um, one that I know concerns some legislators is the amount of borrowing that the governor's proposing over two billion dollars of new borrowing and the reason for some concern is that those bars have been continually going up. Are we debt ridden, ridden like the federal government? No. Um, do we need to pay attention to this a little bit more than in the past? Yeah. I mean if, you, if you're borrowing two and a half, three times more than you did ten years ago, it's probably time to look. About half of that money, by the way, is for transportation. Um, and much of that would go to Southeast Wisconsin. Um, the other way, this is, this is the IOUs, and this is an old favorite of mine. I know you've seen it. This is the state's structural deficits, or these tricks in any budget that get inherited and carried over to the next. And going way back into the 90s, we w would put on the charge card over a half a billion dollars going into every new budget. And that got up to $1.4 billion two years ago at this time. The good news, where that arrow is pointing on the right, is there is no structural deficit at the moment. The problem is that the proposed budget might return us in that direction. Now, is $300 plus million a lot of money compared to the past? No. But if we worked so hard and with such political pain, pain to sort of get things back on an even keel, uh, I think some folks are stopping and wondering whether we should be a little cautious. Um, another sticking point are these what are called gap deficits. The deficits as an accountant would see them on the financial statements. I've shared this with you many times. The bad news was that over the last decade those numbers just kept getting worse. The good news is last year they improved by about seven, eight hundred million dollars and they're going to improve again going into this summer. So the, the de gap deficit will be the smallest it's been really in a number of years. That's that bar that's coming down. The problem is that this budget would start moving those numbers in the wrong direction again. Would they be as bad as three billion? No, but they're not getting smaller, they're getting a little larger. Another sticking point in the budget is what to do about taxes. It's always the governor's proposing a, a tax cut of about $170 million a year on the state income tax, um, <clears throat> accomplished by cutting the bottom three tax rates. And everybody in Madison has a different opinion on this. Some people think the tax cut is too small. Some people think it's too large and that we should maybe hang on to that, some of that money as a cushion against the next recession. Some people say, well, maybe instead of the income tax, we should look at cutting the property tax. And some people remember uh, the 2009 budget when the state increased the top income tax rate and are wondering whether maybe we should pull that down. So there's all sorts of mis uh, different ideas. My concern, I, I sort of let them debate, but my one concern is that I think whatever we do is looks like it's going to be a missed opportunity. Because the, the problem with the Wisconsin state income tax is that it's a mess. And the legislature and governors passed for the last 15 years have really been sort of junking it up with a lot of stuff that nobody uses. The, the instructions and forms have gotten 25% larger. Um, the differences with federal law have tripled on and on and on. Um, so I wish they would have used this opportunity 
to take some of that money to clean up and streamline the income tax because I think if you stop and think about it, you could make an argument that tax law is probably the most difficult law that uh, people face in businesses or in their own lives in terms of regulation. So if you care about regulation, maybe you would want a fairly simple in income tax. Um, there are a couple people in the assembly that are talking about that, including Bill Mark and dad. Um, and uh, so I think we're going to see more on that. Um, another sticking point is school finance. We have a little new money. We're putting some into school finance. Um, where should it go is the big debate. Uh, just some key facts to know. School aids remain the biggest part of the state budget. Medicaid, however, is growing the fastest. It's also, for the typical school district, their largest share of revenue, larger than the property tax. Because the state has had budget problems for a number of years, it used to be that the state school aid appropriation would go up at a fairly good clip every year. And for the last 10 years, the increases have been going like this. And in the 2009 budget, Governor Doyle cut school aids. In the 2011 budget, Governor Walker cut school aids. And combine that with the revenue limit law, which even if you increase school aids, the revenue limit in the last couple of years has said you can't spend the money. Um, revenue limits are a real problem, particularly in rural declining enrollment in Wisconsin. And we looked, we found that there were about 50 school districts out of 425 in the state whose actual revenues in today's dollars are less than they were 10 years ago. So I mean, think about that in terms of your business or your organization. That means they've pretty much been, you know, flat for a very long time. Um, the politics of this, are, if you look at the gray shapes there, Two-thirds of those school districts are in Republican senators' districts, and that's why you see a lot of Republican senators saying, hmm, we, I think we need to talk about this and maybe tweak what the governor uh, wants to do. Um, the other Republican Senate districts are in gray, light gray, and some of those, by the way, have some declining enrollment districts. Um, so to wrap it up, uh, it's sort of a question of are we sort of going to be careful and be characteristically cautious, conservative Wisconsin, or are we going to forget where we had been the last 10 years and sort of go back to the land of Oz in terms of the way we did our finances? Um, what people tend to forget is that the land of Oz had consequences, like state bond ratings dropping 10 years ago and never rising. And in the last four to six years, some really hard spending cuts and some pretty big tax increases. So regardless of your political philosophy, uh, our mischief made a lot of people unhappy. Questions, um, how soon do we want to use our surplus and how do we want to use it, sort of instant or delayed gratification. Some people would like to use it to increase spending, others to cut taxes, others to maintain a reserve. So that's one coming question. Another is just whether we're going to respect the integrity of these funds we have in Wisconsin. And by that I mean the, there's the big general fund and then there's a transportation fund. Um, we spent the last 10 years raiding the transportation fund and borrowing money to do transportation projects. So um, the transportation fund is not in very good shape and we pretty much were dishonest with the public when we said, well, you pay gas taxes uh, for your car use, we're going to take those gas taxes and, and we're going to maintain roads. We didn't. We took the money to balance the state budget. So whether we're going to put the firewall between those two things again is a question. Governor Doyle spent a lot of time moving the money from the transportation fund to the general fund. Governor Walker is now moving money from the general fund to the transportation fund. And um, I'd, I would say that maybe both have some prompt some reason for concern. Um, we talked about debt already, and that is whether 
to the degree that you're building roads or buildings, do you try to do as much of it as you can on a pay-as-you-go basis, or are we going to return to an era of increased borrowing? And then finally, um, are we really solving any problems, or are we just kicking them down the road? We've had about 10 years of a lot of kicking down the road. We, the state really needs to have some discussions about how to clean up and streamline its tax system so it's friendlier to people and businesses. It needs to find, out, find a way to pay for transportation because we don't have a system that does it. So what we've been doing is borrowing, and that'll come back to haunt us. And we really haven't finished having the discussion about how we're going to pay for higher ed in this state. Um, all sorts of issues of tuition levels, financial aid levels, and how much the, le the legislature should micromanage the university or the university should be able to make its own decisions, and there's a lot of suspicion on both sides of that one. So that's sort of where I'm at. There's Toto. Um, Dorothy has skipped out. Um, Toto's exhausted from all the numbers, charts, graphs, and is not only bored, he fell asleep, but I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions if we have any, uh, any time. Um, or if you think I said something that's just totally off the wall, tell me I'm totally wet. So. Well, do you know the system sitting on a surplus? Mm -hmm. um, my underlying understanding is that, that that's another kind of off balance sheet set of books or, or it's not it's not part of the state budget. Mm -hmm. So what I'm reading is that they they were afraid that somebody was gonna cut cut their income stream so they started socking it away and not telling anybody and mm -hmm. and so now where does where does where do you think this is going? Yeah. Um somewhat humorously I have to say that I find it amusing and I'm not trying to make excuses for the for the university here that the folks that managed to run two to three billion dollar deficits on our financial statements for ten years and still are, are somehow concerned that somebody else was running a surplus. But um, this is a hard one. And I, what you find is, well, the university's funding has basically been flat to down for a decade. So inflationary terms, it's been going like that. So what have they been doing? They've been increasing tuition, and Madison has been fundraising like crazy. Um, and so, you know, they've kept the ship afloat with other sources of money other than state tax dollars. Um, Madison now probably 15 to 18 percent funded by the state, um, which gets into this question about how much should the governor and the legislature particularly be telling Madison what to do if Madison, this is controversial, has sort of become a quasi-private <laughs> university. Um, but anyway, so th I think it's true that the university got very wary about what the legislature and governor were going to do to them over the years, and so they kept money on hand. <laughs> And it's gotten probably bigger than it should, but I, I mean, I think it was a defensive posture. That, by the way, is no different than what you're seeing going on in municipalities and school districts and counties, because they haven't never known what the state would do from budget to budget either. Um, so, you know, it's a defensive move. Now, having said that, I think the university system, central administration, has handled this terribly. Um, the best thing to do with politicians is tell them the truth, all the truth, as soon as you can. And, you know, that, uh, there, I don't know how much the Board of Regents actually knew, but apparently some of the Regents knew things weeks before this became public. I would have immediately grabbed the president of the system in several Regents and started knocking on, you know, le legislative leaders' doors and having discussions with them, trying to, you know, before this thing got all blown out of shape, and now it's become totally political. Um, but uh, 
there, you know, there are consequences of a totally unpredictable state budget for the last 10 years. People um, try to protect themselves. A and that's what the university sort of did, and that's what, you know, local governments and school districts are doing. Um, I don't, I don't, that, I hope that's somewhat responsive. Uh, I think there's enough blame <laughs> to, to go around here. I think at this point they should just you know, decide what kind of money the university is going to get and what kind of balances are appropriate. They weren't really hiding anything. It's just that they put out their own f annual financial reports and, you know, nobody looks at a lot of stuff. So, um, other questions? Uh, I read an article that Wisconsin criminal justice cost is twice that of Minnesota. Oh, yeah. And it's billions of dollars. Yeah. Well, yeah, we did a study on that a couple years ago because it really intrigued us too. Because it's true, they're spend, we're spending a lot more on incarcerating people than Minnesota. When you step back, however, what you find is what the two states are spending on cr the criminal justice system are about the same. What's happening is Minnesota is spending its money differently than Wisconsin and maybe smarter because they're not throwing as many people in the slammer. They're, um, they're using more locally based um, community corrections kind of programs where you're out, you're, you're you know, electronically monitored, you're more in touch with your parole agent, whatever. And, and Minnesota thinks that's maybe a, a better, more cost-effective way to go. Um, I think both sides of the aisle in, in Wisconsin recognize that and know that there are probably some people that are in pretty serious jails that could be in some kind of other punishment that would punish them and maybe save some money. It, it's not an easy issue um, and the problem in terms of trying to a attack it is every politician is afraid that if they do something and then we have some horrendous, you know, killing scandal that, you know, then uh, the whole world will blow up. The reason we started building prisons and putting so many people in jail in Wisconsin goes back to the Dahmer crimes. There was a time in the early 90s when the state polling showed that the average Wisconsinite cared more about crime than high taxes, education, <laughs> health care, and that is that just isn't the case in polling usually. So you could see that the people were talking to their elected officials and so but yeah I think that it, it isn't it's a tough issue. We're spending over a billion dollars uh, a year on correction. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's pretty much under control now. It hasn't been growing the way it did during the 90s. For a while it was, it was like 0 to 1 percent of our budget and over the 90s it went to like 7 or 8 percent of our budget and now it's sort of flattened out percentage-wise. But it's a <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, other countries have a lot easier time of it for various cultural <laughs> and religious reasons. And my daughter spent some time in Japan and she said she felt like she was an animal in the zoo the whole time because everybody in Japan from far away looks the same. <laughs> same color hair, same texture hair, same color eyes. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And she was this blonde Wisconsin kid, and she said she felt like she really stood out. But that's, you know, we have lots of different ethnic backgrounds. So, yeah. Uh, if you're familiar with the CJAC committee, it's a Criminal Justice Advisory Commission in uh, Sheboygan. And there are many communities, as Sheboygan County is doing, trying to come up with alternative remedies versus the incarceration. They are costly though. And so, and it's trying to get people in the community to
to uh, buy into the idea that maybe some type of uh, <coughs> treatment plan would be better than having the person incarcerated for mental illness or alcohol or you know things like that. But you have to also get the community to buy into it. But there are definitely other counties where these things are going through, and they are on the table here as well. Um, another thing, and I say just just from personal experience. My wife and I have been involved in mentoring um, teen boys of various colors um, over the last 10 years, and there have been, you know, brushes with the law. And the one thing that I came away struck with is that um, once you've even been in a county jail, um, they just sort of let you out <laughs> onto the street, and there isn't always a place to live. Um, can't find a job, et cetera, et cetera. And so then it just sort of comes back on itself. And I'm thinking of one of our little charges in particular who eventually died of a heroin overdose. You know. So, Any other? Yeah. What's your take on the proposed uh, federal legislation about collecting a, sale, a sales oh, tax on internet? Yeah, uh, 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 yeah that's a good, an oldie but goodie. <laughs> um, I, I'll just give you my own view and some people will really disagree with this. Um, I think there was a time when the internet was relatively young and internet sales were relatively young that people didn't want to dampen a growing part of the economy. I think it's more mature now. I think it's a valid question to ask. Um, if I go downtown and buy a book at Grace's Bookshop and pay sales tax, but don't pay sales tax if I buy online or, you know, pick your product because uh, you can buy pretty much anything online now. I, I have a hard time explaining why that makes sense. Um, and um, the reason that sales taxes aren't being collected, other than Congress said they couldn't and the U.S. Supreme Court says you can't, um, is... Uh, we, we, we sort of needed time to get used to this new economy, but um, I, I think you can see this happening on, on both sides of the aisle, that the perspective is changing and they're starting to think about this. And there are a number of states now, certainly not a majority, that are moving in this direction. Um, it get, it's fraught with all sorts of legal controversy and it really would be best solved if Congress would do something because it gets around some U.S. Supreme Court decisions and so forth. But I, I think probably we, uh, I view it as a level of the playing field. But some people really disagree. Yeah, I think they've been way over, way overplayed. In fact, we have done some in estimates in in house, um, and nationally for Wisconsin there were. Some people at the University of Tennessee that were throwing numbers like 200, 300 million. And we, an economist on our staff, did a really good job of literally getting down to company by company, the big internet company. And there are a fair number of them that, because they have stores and online operations in Wisconsin, they're already paying sales tax. Um, so when you cut through all that, it looks to us like it's more like 40, 50, 60 million a year than two or 300 million a year. So I don't think it's the, the biggie that people think it is.